from the science, everything, everything began. And today I have a distinct pleasure to introduce to you a true scientist. Vladimir Ivković is trained as a cognitive neuroscientist and integrative physiologist with emphasis in neurosensory integration and the space flight, space flight physiology. He graduated from Webster University at the Vienna campus in 1999 and then received master's degrees from his University of Zagreb in Croatia and the International Space Station in France in 2005 and 2006, respectively. He then completed a PhD from University of Houston. He is now in his third year of postdoctoral research at Harvard University. The list of projects our guest, our honored guest, has worked on is both extensive and impressive, including a Harvard team that is investigating on-field brain movement and activity in football players to help determine the cause of head injuries in the sport. He's analyzed the sleep physiology of astronauts living in an isolated habitat for 30 days as a part of the NASA's Human Exploration Research Analog Project. He has collaborated in the development of in-flight brain monitoring devices, including participating in four, four near space flights himself. And of course, he is widely published in neuroscience and biometrics, and is a faculty mentor for research students himself. He would tell you his encounter with the Webster in the 1990s was life-changing, and I think his career since that time only underlines that point. Vladimir, we are so happy to have you here. Welcome home. It is our privilege to share this wonderful facility with your work, with your thoughts, because you are going to become an inspiration for many of our students. Welcome home, and please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Vladimir Ivković to our Webster University. Um, I'm not sure I can follow with enough gratitude <laughs> uh, and humility everything that I've heard uh, so far. But please do allow me to just express my true honor to be here. Uh, first of all, as a Webster alum, somebody who has been sitting in some other benches somewhere, somewhere else, but still within Webster, and somebody who has really truly lived through the Webster spirit, everything that it, it carries with it, right? The interdisciplinarity, the international um, inclusion. And, and I think what's, what's really stuck with me for all these years is the fact that Webster has only expanded on these uh, qualities and has not diminished them, right? So I think Webster has a wonderful story to tell and I am I'm so happy that I, I can contribute my voice to telling that story. So thank you for having me here. Oops, <laughs> um, and for allowing me to just tell you something about what I do and hopefully uh, share some ideas, share some that might be uh, beneficial to all of us as Webster community, as as well as uh, community of scientists and uh, and investigators. So, <clears throat> as I was reading about, uh, as I was, I received the kind invitation to come here from Dr. Strobel uh, and the board. I started reading about what has been happening with Webster uh, for the last century. Um, as a student, as you may appreciate, I was not always up in my reading about history. <laughs> However, I have been trying to make, make do on that. Um, and I was really impressed by, by the amount of uh, upward growth that we have, we have seen in Webster. And I think Browning Hall, with everything that, that it holds, 27, 27 uh, dedicated, uh, uh, dedicated uh, classrooms and, and, and labs, I think that's just amazing. Right? And so to be able to use all that space, to use the talent that you have here, to, to collaborate in really new ways that were not possible before, I think is something that is unparalleled in the history of the university. And I, I think that is something that can, can, can probably change the face of the university itself. What I'd like to start off with is 
all these things that I read about in one place, right? So on this screen, we have all these various uh, uh, disciplines that are going to be represented in this one building. And the, the, the ability to cross-pollinate across these disciplines is something that is, that is the hallmark of the modern science, right? We all talk about interdisciplinary, we all talk about uh, translational, but we still have a problem as a, as a, as a, uh, as, as, a, as a group of, of concerned individuals of how to make that a reality. Regardless of the institutions where we're at, regardless of how we organize our research, there's always problems along the way. And very often these problems are simply embedded in the physical and um, social structures that we encounter. Right? So being able to take research from the bench and all the way to the clinic, for example, uh, is a very challenging task. Being able to have researchers do research and teach students in, under one roof in all these various aspects of human endeavor I, uh, is, is probably the most important first step that does not guarantee success, but it makes it possible. Something that is impossible in many other places. So as I was reading uh, the, 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 the great variety of, about the great variety of these, uh, these disciplines, the first thing that came to mind was Vitruvian man, right? So a symbol really from Leonardo da Vinci that describes not only <clears throat> the complexity of humans, but also the, our, our lacking ability to fully appreciate everything there is to appreciate about the complexity of existence, of the universe, right? We are always in, the, in a quest to understand how complex our life is and, how, and where do we fit in the greater scheme of things. And this is something that students here are going to be challenged with on a daily basis, right? How that relates to what they do later and how we teach them to prepare themselves for the next steps in their careers. What are they gonna do? How are they gonna apply for jobs? How are they going to make a difference in these jobs for the betterment of, of our human condition, of our society, is I think where we can make a big difference and learn from how the classics, if you wish, thought about that. So I thought it was only fitting to kind of <clears throat> bring you an excerpt of one of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, first job applications. Okay, so he was applying for a job of uh, basically of a, of a of an all hands scientist slash artist slash uh, Renaissance man, right? To the to the uh, Duke of Milan. Uh, Ludovico il Moro, and so he was basically touting his talents. He was saying, as you can see here, most illustrious lord, I shall, I shall endeavor without prejudice to anyone else to explain myself, so to bring, bring to, to your attention all of my abilities, showing your lordship my secrets, and to work with effect at opportune moments on all these things, briefly noted below. And so what he noted below is this nice <laughs> filler. <clears throat> and of course, granting the, sorry, it's better. Um, granting that these were different times, however, different times may carry different measures and different interests, but they don't change the way we try to, uh, we try to move forward by basically uh, touting our skills. So what were, what were Leonardo's skills? Right? He, when you look, look down the list, I have a sort of extremely light and strong bridges adapted to be most easily carried. Okay, that's pretty cool. I think about, think, think about 15th century. Um, I know how, when a place is besieged, to take the water out of the trenches and make endless variety of bridges. He kind of had a thing for bridges. <laughs> I have methods for destroying every rock or other fortress, even if they were founded on a rock. Okay comes in handy when you want to you know, bring havoc to another uh, city-state. I have kinds of mortars most convenient and easy to carry, and with these I can fling small stones almost resembling a storm. Okay. And I just want to make a point here that, you know, when we think about Leonardo, we always think about this very gentle soul, right? Okay. We may have to rethink that one. 
and so on, right? So he touts his, his military prowess, engineering prowess, and ability to create weapons of various types of destruction. And if you look all the way down to number, numbers 10 and 11, also, on top of being basically a trained killer, <laughs> in times of peace, I believe I can give perfect satisfaction in architecture, the composition of buildings, and so on. I can carry out sculpture in marble, bronze, or clay, and also I can do it in painting, whatever may be done, as well as any other. <laughs> Another point to be learned here is that we're not always remembered in history as we would necessarily like to be remembered, <laughs> or as we advertise ourselves. But how does that relate to what we are, what we are uh, thinking about here in Browning Hall is that we will give something to our students, right? We will give them knowledge. We will give them skills. We will, give, we will hopefully give them some perspective of the world on how to combine the skills and knowledge into and, and make them uh, able to create something that would be useful to humanity. Not necessarily only weapons, not necessarily only art. Maybe some science. Maybe a combination of these things. Human endeavor as itself is a complex undertaking. And it will take many different disciplines and many different views to provide fodder for progress. Okay? And then, <clears throat> as Leonardo puts it, right, how do we achieve that goal? He proposes that, and if any of the above named things seem to anyone to be impossible or not feasible, I am most ready to make the experiment in your park or in whatever place may please your excellency, to whom I commend myself with the utmost humility. So that brings us back to 27 labs, <laughs> okay? Which I think is, is, is very important because unless we have a way to realize ide our ideas, these ideas are, are likely not going to be worth much in the long run, right? We have to make a connection between ideas and, their, and the fruition of those ideas into tangible artifacts in our society. So when we talk about ideas and making something tangible, this is a short description of a long process. So if we take a look over here, I'm not sure if this will work. Probably not. So these are trends in historic accumulation of recorded ideas. Right? Since the time we started using cuneiform, letters and form to note the, the economic transactions between people in Sumeria over, that would be somewhere around 3100 BC, moving through over Gutenberg and the print, so being able to print and reproduce books, and finally ending up now with the currently fastest supercomputer that's located in China, we see that ideas accumulate exponentially, right? The, the, and our ability to store ideas affects our ability to reproduce them and use them. Now, why is that important? That by itself can be a fact of life, which may not necessarily be related to the human condition. But if we look at the same time, at population growth throughout history, about from the same time, so this is a bit longer scale, but we have cuneiform over here, we have Gutenberg Bible over here, supercomputer here. We see a similar type of growth, okay? Is that a chance event? Is that yeah, only a correlation? Is there some level of interdependency? Based on everything we know, we certainly can say that science and ability to use facts has helped society move forward in protecting human life, also in destroying it, but in improving human condition. That's a rather undeniable fact. We live longer as a species, we tend to die less as a species when we are born, and we generally tend to uh, produce more goods for consumption than at any other time in our recorded history. So the, the relationship between ability to store ideas and our human condition, and use of, using those ideas and the human condition is fairly clear. Now, how do these ideas propagate? And are these ideas the same? 
How many of you have ever heard or read the, uh, the Celtic myth? Okay, so a few. <clears throat> the idea, so the idea, good. <laughs> so the, the concept of ideas taken on form of physical entities is not a new concept, right? This is something that Richard Dawkins, originally a zoologist, introduced in his famous uh, book called The Selfish Gene, when he based, where he basically was discussing the evolution of life from the very early onsets all the way to complex life that we know today. And he, made a par he created a parallel between the gene, which carries the biological information for the offspring, and everything that comes with genes, so in terms of biological protection and so on, with their equivalent in the, in the realm of ideas, which he called memes. Okay. And we, use, we tend to use today, we tend to use memes in a fairly um, broad sense. I'm sure everybody has seen various types of memes on Facebook, right? These are only partially reflective of the original idea. Memes, as Dawkins defined them, are units of cultural transmission or units of imitation or replication. Anything from personal gestures, for example, uh, people you grew up with, right? We all have our little idiosyncratic ways about us. And so somebody slurps coffee, somebody drinks tea in a certain way and so on. And if, if we're exposed to those behaviors, we tend to pick them up, whether we want to or not, okay? And so we carry them with us. And as we do, they become our hallmark. And then we can spread these ideas further on without really intending to do so, right? That would be a meme. However, memes can be more complex. Memes can be ideas or concepts that are created to be spread around, right? So just like genes tend to create these complex structures about them that end up being complex organisms like humans who tend to do all sorts of things to protect the genes, so very minute, elements of us, so do ideas tend to create epimimetic, if you wish, effects in society. So as ideas spread, they carry with them potential for change, change in society and change in the ideas themselves. Just like genes mutate sometimes, so do ideas, and they adapt. That it brings us to a very crucial point, I think, of distinguishing which ideas are worth pursuing and which ideas are worth scrutinizing more maybe than some others. When we think about the, the general concept, uh, uh, some, some proposition that is based on an idea, right? It basically encompasses several things. It encompasses the truth in the world, whatever that may be. It encompasses our belief about that. Okay, and those intersect at some point. So we'll probably, our beliefs are probably going to somehow be related to some truths in the world, okay. but not all of them. The intersection, for the most part, <clears throat> can be described as poorly justified true beliefs, right? So we, for example, we believe that tomorrow the sun will come up. That's a pretty solid, belief based on our empirical experience, right? However, none of us, mostly none of us, I guess, have actually made astronomical observations of the sun and calculated its motion within our galaxy or the Earth around the sun, right? So we take a lot for granted in our belief based on our ex uh, uh, observation, okay? So while this is a fairly solid uh, true belief, it is still a belief. Right? We, we have not ourselves empirically tested it. On the other hand, there are those things that we can call knowledge. Right? So what is knowledge? Knowledge is fully tested concepts that hold true regardless of our beliefs, okay? And while that, that also uh, reflects on the poorly justified true belief that I just described, it, it, it excludes many other beliefs 
that we hold but have no basis in the truth or how we experience the truth. So being able to basically weed the, uh, separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of ideas is I think the most important part of how science can contribute to the society. And how do we do that? Obviously there are philosophy of science, and I'm sure there's many philosophers here. Uh, philosophers of science have debated this idea and notion for a long time, for over 3,000 years. But where we stand today is very close to what Karl Popper, the famous Austrian philosopher of science, um, proposed in his Logic of Scientific Discovery. He said that <clears throat> insofar as scientific statements speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And insofar as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality. Okay. What does that mean? It basically means that if we have an idea, we really can't fully test, test its truthfulness unless there is a way for us to prove that it could be wrong. Okay. When we can do that, we can basically move that bar of truth and test the ideas that we have about the world. For example, if we want to test whether the sun will rise tomorrow, what we will do, we will make observations day upon day upon day upon day. Right? And in, in so doing, we will create a set of data points that will tell us the sun will rise tomorrow. Right? But we, we also have to create a way to test if that is not going to happen. Okay? So, if the sun does not come out tomorrow, there has been data since the beginning of observations that the sun comes up tomorrow because it has a certain, certain pattern of motion within our galaxy and because the Earth has a certain pattern of motion around the, around the, the sun. And so to falsify the original belief, we would basically need to show that these truths are not true. As far as we can tell, based on all of our observations, based on all of our measurements, these are truths that have not been refuted yet. If somebody wanted to refute them, somebody would have to come up with an alternative um, uh, dynamics of the, of the uh, solar, uh, solar system's bodies that we have not previously contended for, that would also have to account for repetitive showing up of the sun at particular times of the day at various places on the earth. Okay? So to be able to falsify an idea, an idea, we need to provide a way to test it, and we need to provide a way to explain it. So this is an important piece of uh, scientific methodology that I think sits at the basic, uh, at the basis of why science or scientific, um, a scientific method and the knowledge that it produces is different from other quote unquote uh, knowledge that has been based on, on poor beliefs. And that is because we have a method that we can, on the one hand side, on one hand, we can use it to prove certain things, certain phenomena, and we also can use the same method to falsify it. And unless we find proof that we can falsify something, then we have to contend with the fact that, at least for now, this is the best explanation of the universe we have. So, ideas are not all created equal. Because science creates ideas which are based on solid proof and solid method. This is not to say, and this is something that we hear very often, especially recently, that, oh, scientists are talking about, you know, something, some, something or the other today, but they're going to change their mind the other, you know, in a few weeks because they're going to find something else. And then they're going to be saying that, well, this is something new we found. And so whatever we knew before 
uh, is irrelevant. That does not happen like that. The way that the science works is through continuous observation and building upon the knowledge that was created using these same methods throughout the history of science. And this, this, is, this is where we come and are informed by famous Thomas Kuhn, who wrote the, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, no less, that normal science means research firmly based upon one or more past scientific achievements, achievements that some particular scientific community acknowledges for a time as supplying the foundation for its further practice. Science is not static. Science is dynamic. If science was static, none of us would, ne would ever need to be here. Browning Hall would not need to exist. Might as well build a mausoleum to science instead of Browning Hall. Brian's, uh, science is a continuously evolving enterprise because we learn, and as we learn, we incorporate our new knowledge based on scientific method into our working models and theories. And this is how science propels itself. Science is never, never static. It is continuously evolving. Otherwise, we would have no jobs. So. But this is really important because <clears throat> when one defines science, we see that it basically consists of <clears throat> principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. Okay? So this is what we do on a daily basis. We don't take beliefs and integrate them in our uh, systems of knowledge with no ver without verification. We verify. This is what scientists do. And this is what differentiates scientific ideas from beliefs. This is not going to be a stats class. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I just included this here as a reminder of how we do science and, and how we use various facets of science, including math and, and, and statistics to inform our knowledge about the world. Because when you think about it, science is a, and I think for many people, including myself, this is a source of great frustration. When you're doing science, you are continuously scratching your head. You're, you can have an idea of what's happening, but you really are not sure. And it leaves you feeling pretty dumb a lot of the time. I presume everybody recognizes what this is, right? Normal distribution, the bell curve, right? What do we have here? What is in the middle over here? The green. Anybody? This is where most of, most of the normally distributed data falls, right? So if you take, took a random sample of some, some, some phenomena, right, you would expect that as you tested something, for example, height of people in a population, that most people would fall somewhere, somewhere in, the, in between the first 69% <clears throat> of, the, of the mean, right? So let's say the average height of a, of a person in the United States is 1.78 meters, right? Then that would be here. And then we would have the first standard deviation from that mean within, within the 69% of all data. Okay? As we move to the outer ranges of the distribution, we will see less and less people belonging to these groups. So you would have shorter people and taller people. Okay? Again, fairly equally distributed, but a smaller proportion. And finally, when we move all the way out to the end, this is where you have people who are very short, people who are very tall. Okay. Why is that important? It's important because this defines how we think and how we prove the concepts we are testing. Okay. When you look at this, this distribution, where do we expect to find more, most people? here, right? And then we expect to find less here, 
and least on the sides. So the probability of something, <coughs> some event belonging to each of these categories is relative to that distribution, okay? So we can now form an expectation. Now we can expect something to happen. And if it doesn't happen, that brings really the big, the big question. Why hasn't it happened? Why, has, why is something defying our expectation? To test that, this is the last stats slide. It has two parts, so I'm just going to go. <laughs> so everything, basically, all science, all scientific experiments, can basically be reduced to hypothesis testing, ultimately. right? So we're testing some, some hypothesis this, that is based on a belief and some quantity of knowledge about that particular phenomenon. Okay? So our null hypothesis is always going to be that whatever we find in the real world, in the observations that we have, is going to be purely by chance, due to chance, okay? The age one, or our testing hypothesis, our, our experimental hypothesis, is going to be that we will find something because uh, of, of an effect, okay? And then we can compare, right? whether our observations will mirror our expectations, right? So, alpha and beta, right? Alpha, over here, probability of a type one error. That means that in, in uh, reality, right, this was, this was, uh, this was, uh, this was something that we, have not seen, that we have not seen, but uh, we expected it to see it, right? Conversely, beta probability of type two error is seeing too little in our data, okay? Why is this important? It's important because that then informs us about how to think about the findings that we have. Where does the finding that we have gotten with, within a certain experiment fall on this curve. Do we expect it, if we expected it to fall here, it fell here, right? Why is that? How can we explain that? If we expected it to be here, yet we ended up here, why is that? Okay. And so we can, we can, so we can calculate probabilities of events that something is due to something or something is due to something else. And this is how the science works, basically. This is how, this is what the basis of science is, right? We are, we are, we are simply testing our expectations based on knowledge and beliefs against what we observe in the world. And by doing so, on a large enough sample, we are able to then come to conclusions about certain phenomena, or at least the way that we have observed and investigated these phenomena. And this is where, again, science is not static, it's dynamic. We continuously improve our, our method of, methods of detection and analyses, and we continuously improve our methods. And so our results continuously change, but until they start disproving our previous findings, we should basically keep up with what we know because we'll not have enough evidence to refute it. So even though there may be indications that maybe not all phenomena can be explained by a certain theory, that theory is still supported by predominance of evidence, which is not, which which has not been refuted. So when it when it comes to ideas, when it comes to how we use these ideas in the real life, it is very important to keep in mind that these ideas are based on observation and experimental testing. These are not based on our beliefs, which I think is a crucial point to take away when we start thinking about how we as scientists sh should change the world. It's much better than stats. How do we even get to take this picture? 
So this was a picture taken in 1968, just before, on Christmas Eve. And it's called, or it's been known as, uh, uh, Earthrise. Okay. This is the picture that was taken by astronauts for the Apollo 8 uh, spacecraft that was circling the moon. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> this was actually uh, a chance event that somebody took this picture because they were not expecting, they did not have, uh, as they do in space flight, they did not have specified time to take pictures at that point, but they just happened to have been circling the moon, came up around, uh, it came up the, uh, the horizon and uh, noticed this absolutely stunning view of the Earth. So they grabbed the camera and took many, many shots, right? And this was the one that, was, that became famous. The reason why I have it here is because this particular image has probably had more social impact um, that we know and do not know about than probably most other images ever taken. The reason for that is that within 10 years from this image, we have had a whole development of a whole new area of research in environmental protection. Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has been formed only several years after this image was taken. The, uh, uh, the movement to protect the environment, so the land, the, the water, the air, has really taken off after these images, images became available to us. Because for the first time, we were able to take ourselves away from the immediate and now and transcend of what it means to, really to be human in a universe that is really unforgiving. So looking at the Earth from Moon made us realize how unique this place is and has had profound social impact. As we continue to look for ways that both we as a species and change the environment, and as the environment changes because of its natural cycles, we're beginning to use information from various disciplines geology, uh, sociology, political science, biology, and so on, zoology, to, to, to come up with ways to uh, not only understand what is happening to our planet and to the living beings on that planet, but also inform how we should change our behavior to promote positive change and to uh, dampen the negative change. This is just a, a review from National Geographic in 2015 of the socioeconomic trends on the left-hand side and Earth system trends on the right-hand side uh, that were basically happening for the last three centuries. Right? So we have everything from world population growth, <coughs> excuse me, uh, GOP growth, foreign direct investments, urban population, primary energy use on this side, and then here we have stratospheric ozone, surface temperature rise, ocean acidification, uh, marine fish capture, domesticated land, methane increase, nitrous oxide increase, carbon dioxide increase, right? All of these things, all these graphs that don't even fit on one slide have been produced by one, painstaking science, and two, integration of different sciences that enabled the production of these complex um, uh, research uh, outcomes. Okay. So to understand the world, scientists need to collaborate. So interdisciplinary is really not just a thing that sounds good, it's not a slogan, it's a necessity. And it's becoming a greater necessity by the day in the world that we live in today because of the integration of different societies around the world and the global effects that we have as a species on the planet itself and our existence on this planet. This brings us back to you know, the, the idea of what do we do as scientists and w w as we use our uh, hypotheses and scientific method to test the world we live in, how do we inform the change that we want to see happen in the world? Scientists from all sorts of fields really need to collaborate because there is more and more knowledge and understanding of the interdependence of 
our existence within the environment and environmental existence with us. And we can take our existence to the extremes and learn a lot about what it means to be human and how human condition on Earth could change if we don't necessarily stop certain things that we are doing, doing today. For example, over here we have proteomics, right? Understanding proteins, building blocks of life, really, right? How do pro <clears throat> proteins, pro pro proteomics is supremely important in understanding not only how do we, how do diseases occur, how they happen, how we treat diseases, but also how the building blocks of life are literally put together and what, we can, what that informs us about our ability to control life and to improve it or otherwise modify it. That is directly related, for example, to changes in climate. Okay? We have <clears throat> the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, reduction in overall biodiversity that we have ever seen in the history of recorded, in recorded history. And a lot of that is depending, dependent on the climate changes that are occurring. Some because of human activity, some others because of natural cycles. But understanding these, these interplays is crucial for understanding our ability to adapt to the changes that are continuously happening to us as a species. And finally, something that I will talk about a bit more, because this is my area of research. For example, understanding human spaceflight and how does the body change in space and what that informs us about changes in the human body in, on, on, on the planet Earth. Some of the conditions that we see in astronauts are reversible and some are not. Many of them, however, cannot be modeled on Earth unless we have patients. So we have people who, on Earth who suffer from various diseases. Now we can't really understand these diseases fully well unless we have model organisms to go through the same types of changes that they go due to their illness. While animals are being used in research, they're only model organisms, they're not humans. So when we send people to space, we monitor what's happening with their bodies and we try to make connections between the changes we see in them because of environmental conditions and those that we can, uh, that we can uh, the analogous ones that we, we see in uh, clinical processes on Earth. So I'm not gonna go into this. Human body in space changes a lot, <laughs> okay? Uh, there's effects of microgravity, there's effects of various gases we have in the body, uh, there's, there's effects of radiation. So how human spaceflight changes us uh, reflects on how human condition varies on Earth with various, various uh, clinical conditions or diseases, as well as the natural process of, of aging on Earth. Now, why is interdisciplinarity so important? I think that understanding, as I said, this combination of things and confluences of, of effects on human, human existence and our effects on the environment really uh, describes that in the best possible way. In a recent 2015 recent review in Nature magazine, um, there was a, they, they did a meta-analysis of all papers, so scientific papers, that had interdisciplinary in their title, okay? And what they have shown, so we have social sciences, sciences in, um, in green and natural sciences and engineering in red, right? We see that social sciences have been doing much better in terms of integrating different interdisciplinary um, disciplinary views into their published work than did, for example, natural sciences. Now there may be a propensity in the in the uh, social sciences to do to to be maybe a bit more cavalier with the term interdisciplinary. On the other hand, uh, we see that there is a big disparity between natural and social sciences. How does that affect how does that affect the uh, the overall uh, publication of of work that has been done within one field as opposed to integrating with other fields. When we look into natural sciences on top, right, <clears throat> we see that references with, within the same specialty, the orange line, kind of flat line, or even decreased towards the end of the 2010, 
references to other specialties in some dis same discipline kind of do the same, while references to other disciplines actually start rising up. Okay? And we see a similar trend in the social sciences. So while we do not necessarily use the term interdisciplinary, there, we are referencing other people's work. And so the work that is done in other disciplines. Okay? So I think that's a very important, um, very important development because Brown and Hall is an interdisciplinary building, right? Which will promote just this type of type of work, right? The work where you will have people from sociology, from um, human rights, uh, biology working together to try to figure out ways of dealing with problems that we tend to face for various reasons. And if just just imagine the 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 some of the most uh, pressing issues that we have today, for example, various refugee crises, right? Social issue, social issue, human rights issue, biological issue. Uh, how do we deal with these with, with with the people who have lost everything and medical care for these people? How do we tend to their social and, and psychological needs, right? So there is a need to understand very a problem for various aspects, and and provide a comprehensive solution or solutions uh, in a holistic manner. And to kind of put things into perspective, right? Why we are having this discussion now is because interdisciplinary science tends to have a long-term effect rather than a short-term uh, payout. Right? So if we look over here, right, on a scale more interdisciplinary, less interdisciplinary work, we see that the effects of the first three years are fairly small, right? So you have these complex studies. We have complex studies that are, you know, kind of nebulous and they're not really fully clear what we're what they're gaining. But as we get more specific data from both from these uh, fields as well as adjoining fields, so that, that that create a context, the data that we have created in these studies tends to rise over the course of ten or more years. Okay, so this undertaking really does pay out. Right. So how do we, I was expecting, hoping there would be more students here. So I was trying to stimulate them at this point. So how do you make your stories, uh, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do we do really change the world the way we want to change it uh, using our science, right? So as Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world, okay? So I think that every one of us has a bunch of stories that are just ours, right? That are idiosyncratic, that are nobody's but ours. And I think there's always a way for us to integrate our specific experiences and our stories into not only the science that we do, but also in the, in the outcomes that we want to see. And hopefully these outcomes would improve the world. Mine, for example, started over here in a very unlikely place uh, com compared to what I do today, right? I, uh, I'm Croatian and I've done my master's work like over here. <laughs> it's a small island kind of halfway between Croatia and Italy. It looks like that, it's beautiful. So if you had to pick a, an isolated space, a place to do a, your master's, it's pretty good. Um, and what we were doing there, we were, we were doing field research in, um, in behavioral neuroscience. We were trying to figure out whether a population of that small island was different genetically um, in, in particular, I was looking at a gene for, that codes for, transporter genes, for serotonin transporters in the brain. Um, whether that population had a different frequency of these particular types of genes, alleles of that gene, compared to a population of a major city. And whether that reflected, was reflected in psychological traits. And so this is one of the first findings that we, <clears throat> that we have published, where we have shown that not only that is the case, but also that there is appreciably different psychological profile and genetic profile, right? Between, for example, an isolated speck of land in the middle of Adriatic, right? And a metropolitan area that is genetically open, right? And so while doing that, I realized that understanding the brain and understanding how the brain works uh, really is impossible when you don't have the appropriate tools, okay? So over here, what we have, 
are your regular tools in a major clinical center that you can use to monitor what's happening with the human brain at any point in time, right? However, here, there was none of that. Okay. <laughs> the beaches were great, but there was no MRI. And so this spurred me to try to figure out a way how do we bring this over there? And what changes do we need to make to make that possible, right? So there, there's too, there, there, the mass of these devices is too high, power is too big, power requirements, volume, time, money. There's no way we could use these in isolated environments. However, people in isolated environments need them. So in my current lab, this is how I got to my current lab, what we are doing, we are investigating ways of reducing the, you know, the size of the MRI to like something like this. Okay? And this is my regular work day. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, basically what we're doing, we are trying to minimize brain monitoring and physiologic monitoring that can be deployed pretty much anywhere. Our work uh, has been funded by NASA and, um, and, um, and other agencies, but the primary interest there was to bring the capability for physiologic monitoring and brain monitoring in, an, in extreme environments. So anywhere from space flight to submarines to you know, uh, field hospitals or some, some places wherever in the world where there is lacking or limited uh, medical resources for clinical investigation or for, uh, for, for diagnostics, okay? So how, where do we apply these? Human spaceflight, as I said, contact sports, and firefighting. These are the extremes in which people operate, and as they operate in these extremes, they're exposed to extreme stressors. And by learning, or, or by monitoring and learning what types of physiological responses we have to these stressors, we can learn a lot about our coping mechanisms, and that may inform us how do these processes happen uh, in various types of diseases that cause problems similar to those we see in these activities. So for example, our studies involved work on uh, cognitive performance in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the, the so-called twins study with Mark and Scott Kelly aboard the ISS. And coming back to the Vitruvia man, right? <laughs> this is all the things that happened to, <clears throat> to Scott Kelly when he was, he was up in space. Um, we do research aboard the International Space Station. We do research in Antarctica, where we look into effects of isolation, for example, and, uh, and behavioral issues that, that occur that also affect uh, immunological responses. Um, we do um, an a lot of analog studies. So we bring people to extreme environments like deserts or um, high mountains where we put them in operational environments where we simulate um, work on a space mission and we monitor their, their, um, their physiological and, brain and, and performance of, of, uh, of their brain function. We do underwater research where we test people in, again, isolated and confined spaces in an underwater habitat where they need to perform, again, simulated space missions but under real um, operational environment, so you know they cannot just swim up to the to the surface and say, "Ah, had enough. <laughs> I'm not going to participate in research anymore." Uh, then actually need to stay there for a while. Uh, we do bed rest studies. We have people lay in bed, uh, kind of slightly tilted, with their feet up, to simulate microgravity and the effects of microgravity on the cardiovascular system. Um, and we also do, <coughs> excuse me, we also do uh, studies in HERA, which is the Human Exploration Research Analog down in Houston, where we literally sequester uh, people in this habitat for 30 or 45 days, a uh, crew of four or five, and um, basically have them simulate a mission to an asteroid belt, and we monitor their performance during that time. So using the device that I have shown you and similar devices like that. So. Um, these are some of the images from training. So this is a crew member performing a, a docking task. So docking two spacecraft together. This is their, um, their, their bunk bed. This is where they sleep. But actually, this is their whole room, not a bunk bed. <laughs> not a lot of space. Um, this is another performance uh, simulator. And this involves, obviously, a, a large team of people who 
make this type of research possible. There's a there's mission control that allows really um, very realistic type of uh, interaction between crew members. For example, in later stages of the mission, when they are far away from Earth, there's always a 20 minute delay in communication. So if something goes wrong, they're on their own. Uh, so so we keep it really real for them, and we monitor effects of <clears throat> of these operational demands on on stress. We do parabolic flights, so we basically fly in, in zero G aircraft for about 40 parabolas per flight, and uh, during that time we monitor changes in um, in perfusion of blood in the in the entire body, primarily in the head, because that affects, for example, uh, the the changes in uh, pressure within the skull. Right. So as as some of you may know. There's a lot of people on Earth who suffer from hydrocephalus, which is accumulation of fluid in the head, right? And there are various ways to deal with that, but there are some conditions that where, where this happens for no apparent reason. Also, some conditions where increased pressure in the head, um, in the skull, uh, causes uh, strokes or impairments of various sorts. So understanding these mechanisms really uh, is, uh, is possible or partially possible through uh, exposure of people to short bouts of, of uh, microgravity, where we have increase in pressure and decrease in pressure that is fairly controlled, and then we can and we're trying to understand the mechanisms of these of these disabilities. We use our devices for extreme environments of basically climbing up Kilim uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, and we see how this is basically uh, oxygenation of blood in the head as people perform these activities. So we can monitor people under extreme conditions, under clinical conditions, and learn about the differences and what causes them. Some more. And then finally, <clears throat> we do something that a lot, of a lot of people talk about these days, and that's uh, <clears throat> brain research in, um, in contact sports and traumatic brain injury. So as you can see, this is, not, this is never a good day for anybody when this happens. For your brain, uh, recent studies have shown that 99% of football players who have uh, who have died prematurely have uh, had the uh, the uh, the condition that is most likely associated with uh, repeated impacts to the head. So this is this area of research bears significance not only to the sport but also to, for example, traumatic brain injury due to either traumas of various sort like car crashes, but also the military personnel who are exposed to blasts that cause these types of injuries. So for the first time, for example, we have been able to show, again, using this portable technology, that you, we can monitor the motion of the brain itself in the skull, right? So as you turn your head, as you move around, your brain sloshes around your head. And as it does that, if you do it too fast and stop too fast, the brain basically bumps against the skull and likely causes, creates an injury, an internal injury that then causes over a long period of time with repeated exposures causes likely these, um, uh, these chronic traumatic encephalopathies. Your, uh, your nervous system responds by uh, sweating, right? And you may not necessarily sweat profusely, but we can monitor the change in skin conductance uh, by just applying electrodes on the skin. And that way we can monitor the, the amount of stress that we see in during during performance of these various activities, right? So we can monitor uh, that uh, movement of the head and the body, temperature, uh, activity of the heart, uh, and then also changes in the uh, in the oxygenation in the brain. All of these have been related to as 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 have been have been uh, uh, recognized as indicators of stress. Right? And so to come back to the Vitruvian man and to how do we make a change in the world, right? I think we need to make the change by, on the one hand side, doing something we really love and believe in, and using the methods that we know work to build upon later and create new methods that will hopefully work better. And in doing so, I think we'll create or continue to create a cycle where we produce outcomes that are reliable, falsifiable, as I said, um, and ultimately will have an impact in this world. And I think a big part of this is just being, trying to be as humble as we can and trying to understand where we are in this universe, that not everything revolves around us, right? This is the, the famous pale blue dot, an image that was taken by 
by a spacecraft that is now one of the objects that is furthest away from the, from the, from the planet Earth um, as it was leaving uh, the solar system. Okay? And this was an idea of the famous Carl Sagan who said, oh, let's turn the camera around and see if we can spot Earth. And so we did. And I think just like that moonrise photo that gave us the beauty of the Earth, this one gave us the really utter smallness of us as a species in our planet in the vast universe. So we should be humble, but move forward. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I'm just really curious about how your interest, and thank you for your service with the, volunteer, the firefighting, how your um, research and interest in your firefighting, how that came together. Could you speak on that for just a minute? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's doing things you love, really. That's, <laughs> if, if I wasn't a scientist, I'd probably be a firefighter full time. Um, it came about by, by simply um, observing what was lacking in daily operations uh, in firefighting and, you know, and that in the context of what we know about physiological problems that firefighters have. For example, a lot of firefighters die of cardiovascular uh, insults of various sorts, uh, but also something that has been, and, and cancer, but something that has been kind of overlooked for a long period of time are uh, psychological trauma. Uh, traumas that exist in firefighting service. Uh, there's several aspects of that. And so I had a personal experience with some of my crew who were uh, military veterans and uh, they were fine for the most part, right? But then at certain times, they would just go into this panic attack um, when they were in a confined space, okay? And this was something that nobody picked up before. This was something that was to, to, to everybody else, this, during a drill, this was something that nobody expected would, would, would have caused this type of a, uh, an overt reaction, right? And so that stuck with me for a long time, and I was trying to figure out a way to think about whether there's a way to recognize uh, some biomarkers or any other way that would, any other indicator of susceptibility to, to, to you know, to react like this in people who are otherwise normal, otherwise act fine, otherwise are totally normal in every other aspect of their behavior. Um, the reason why that is important is because we know that there's been several recent studies that have shown that up to 22% of firefighters experience PTSD and uh, up to 47% of firefighters uh, have suicidal thoughts or ideas. Right, which if you think about what these people do as their job and when you get to see them, hopefully never, but these people respond right in the worst times for other people. So you wanna be able to rely on these people to perform their job to, to their absolute best. Now, if, if there's an issue, behavioral issue or psychological issue that is hidden, then it needs to be addressed. And so this is how this latest project came about. It was from personal experience and then combining what I figured were our capa technical capabilities and trying to see if we can bring those two together and provide some sort of an outcome that might, in the long run, produce uh, either a, a detection method for signs of PTSD or uh, provide some way of basically uh, understanding who would be more susceptible or who less to respond um, to, to stressors in that way, and how do we then help them, right? Not stop their fire service, but help them in terms of uh, behavioral support or cognitive behavioral training or whatever. Thank you very much. This was truly inspirational for me personally, as I'm getting ready to leave Webster. Uh, I have a question for you. How is your time at Webster um, back in your 
uh, maybe undergrad years or, or right after had impacted what, you, what you're doing today with the rest of your career? Yeah, um, tremendously, tremendously. And the reason for that is um, it allowed, so while I was at Webster, I felt like I had uh, the time and the ability to focus on the things that I really liked in my studies, right? So there was, on the one hand side, like there was really direct access to my professors, which was really cool, and that really helped. Um, and on the other hand, um, I had pretty, uh, pretty large freedom in choosing the courses that I would take. And in doing so, I think I was able to kind of literally, and maybe, you know, <laughs> thinking in retrospect, maybe that was not the most responsible thing to do. You know, <laughs> think about the courses that, I, that, that I've taken. But I was really, really just doing what I really liked. And I think that really helped me kind of move in a certain direction, right? Then, and that obviously that, that then kind of continued on with, uh, with the stuff that I did later. But all of that was based on my, my, my experiences and my, my education at Webster, right? So it was, it was really this ability to kind of mold your education to your actual interests rather than you know, having a strict, uh, strict curriculum that you can't change and you're stuck with it and yeah, whatever, right? So uh, I really enjoyed that. I think that made a huge difference. I'm loud enough, I probably don't need this. Um, the device that, uh, the condensed version of an MRI that you were talking about, is that something your team developed or, okay, so do you have plans to kind of mass market that into um, spaces that folks can benefit from it? So I think that's, yeah, so, so first of all, yeah, so the device, the, the concept of the device was developed by, uh, by my uh, principal investigator some 10 years ago, and we have been working for the last 10 years, that I've, uh, five years that I've been there, we've been working on changing it and molding it to different, um, different uh, technological uh, specifications that we would need to apply it to different uh, populations and environments, right? So, but yeah, there is absolutely idea, overall idea, to deploy or to create a commercial product out of this that would be available uh, for all sorts of applications. Now, the, you know, it may seem like, oh great, this is like this cool device um, and everybody would be all over it because it allows to do so many things. The, the problem is that uh, we need to test the device so much more to be able to show that it actually uh, does do what we say it does. So we have good data, good preliminary data, but there's a lot more testing to be done before we actually get to the point where it's commercial viable and uh, where we can actually say that it's it's going to work 100% of time. Yeah, but yeah, short, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, this was a great talk. Thank you so much for coming to us and visiting us. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in <coughs> monitoring the body processes. I feel like this could be something really useful in sort of cognitive and developmental biology. So we, many of us here are parents and we have young children who are immersed in virtual reality and video gaming where they experience certain situations that seem real, particularly in a 3D environment. And what is that doing as far as their physiologic response? And what is that doing to them psychologically as far as future experiences in real life with other people in traumatic situations? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted a population to study, there's a few children I know who are in virtual reality situations <laughs> playing war games, you know, that are kind of scary when I look yeah. at them. And, and yeah. so I was wondering if you'd ever thought about, you know, along those lines, like tapping into the cognitive psychologists and the, the developmental biologists about the, how your experiences impact then your future responses mm -hmm. in populations that are highly plentiful and, you know, common today. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, absolutely. I, the, the goal of all research, and, and this is kind of, I think, the overarching idea of, of the, of, of what I wanted to say, but also the specific projects that, that we're working on, right, should always be improving quality of life of somebody, okay, and, and being able to do so to the people that need it most. Now, um, I, we have obviously uh, thought about various applications, and one of the things is certainly developmental psychology and, and basically um, uh, 
trying to figure out what are the effects of um, both perceptual and emotional effects of exposure to high stress environments or immersive environments like VR um, on children's developing fear responses, for example, right? We know that, and this is the research we do with the firefighters, right? We know that um, uh, exposure to repeated trauma creates a heightened sense of uh, threat, right? Which is ultimately PTSD, right? You rethink about things that, that you have seen, you uh, relive them, and you become startled easily and become much more aggressive than norm normally you would be. Does that happen with, with children playing video games? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. I'm no, uh, no, no, no um, expert in the field at all, but it does seem like a very plausible, uh, plausible um, area of study that could certainly benefit from the types of devices we're working on. to be more interdisciplinary in what we do. Hmm. <laughs> You'd never be on the videotape if you don't use it. I, I mean, practically, I mean, of course, now we, we, can, we can have a philosophical answer, but I think practical one would be good. I think literally it comes down to organizing um, like faculty student meetings uh, or journal clubs or however you want to organize it where you, you would actually discuss interdisciplinary research based on students' interests, right? So if you, I'm not sure if you have any, like if you're talking about undergrads or, or graduate students, but undergrads with more guidance, graduate students with less guidance, more freedom, um, to allow them to explore their interests on one hand side and see how those interests may uh, affect some other discipline that we have represented here and what they can learn from that other discipline. Right? I think, it's, I think that, that is crucial. For example, if we're gonna have nursing students and then you're gonna have psychology students and then you're gonna have, I don't know, human rights students, right? Something that came, as, as I mentioned, right? I mean, think about possibilities of what we can do, for example, for underprivileged populations of various sorts, right? How do we, how do we uh, assess the impact of, you know, re, let's bring a paper about assessing the impact of access to uh, healthy food, right, in a certain population, how that affects the rates of obesity, cancer, and so on that population, and how does that reflect in psychometric scores that these pe people get, right? And then you, have, you basically have a buy-in from, you have a buy-in from, from three distinct groups of people, students, who will engage in this because they recognize they're part of the story, right, and can contribute to the, to the biggest story, right? So I think that's, that's one way of doing that. I, I, it's something that we have been doing for some time. Uh, and I think, I, but I think crucially, it's getting people's interest involved in the process, right? Whatever, you know, whatever makes you laugh and smile and be like super, <laughs> super happy when you, when you do your studies or research, just, you know, try to bring that up, right? For me, that was like, that was space flight and firefighting. You know, it's like, who doesn't like that, right? So, no, but, but to me, no, seriously, to me it was that. And I am, I'm just the happiest person on the planet being able to do what I do. Uh, it's not, to me, it's not work, right? But it's something that I live for. So I don't think about this as a chore, you know? I mean, I think of various chores that I have to do in doing science, right? But, you know, and, and, and people that I work with are kind of like that. And I think that's really, if we can bring that out, I'm sure people have interests that can be, that can be uh, put to good use and can be kind of molded into an interdisciplinary mold that would enrich that interest and synergize it with other interests. And then everybody comes up kind of with a, a more complete picture of what they're doing and where they're going, hopefully. So. We have time for one more question. Going back to the topic of space flight, um, my question to you is, are you planning on like um, flying any experiments on commercial ventures like Blue Origins or Virgin Galactic? Yeah, so, great question. So um, we don't have any immediate plans, but that would certainly be something that we would be looking at because of the, so uh, working with, uh, working with, with uh, NASA's budgets, right, 
you, you're always depending on, depending on the budget situation in a particular year, right? And so that is changing dramatically from year to year, from administration to administration. So it may help to diversify with, for example, Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic. We haven't gone there yet, but we have, um, we have thought about that, yes. So, so certainly the great thing is that there seems to be a diversification of programs that allow access to space. So we'll see how that will all go, but yeah, it looks promising. Well, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, we will reconvene in 10 minutes uh, for the faculty panel. So that'll be about 2.40, well, I shouldn't say about, it will be at 2.45. Um, and let's thank uh, Vlad for a wonderful <laughs> keynote speech. <laughs>